Hello, everyone, and welcome to our podcast. We are Team Earth, and we're going to talk about the human relationship between animals and humans. We're more common than you guys might think. My, my name is Eric. I'm Emma. I'm Antoinette. Hi, everyone. This is Manjot. And I'm Jaden. Yeah, so let's talk about Powell, which is like one of the first readings we did in class. It's the one with the uh, Egyptians and animals as messengers to the gods. I remember from that class, we, we talked about how people discovered mummies and they're like super, they're like super into mummies, which had, I think, pharaohs and stuff like that. I think it's interesting because, I mean, I think, at least I did when I was a kid, learned about like mummification and how, you know, the whole process was when someone important died, you know, they're buried with, with uh, certain things, but I never really thought about how they might do it with animals or like maybe a important, yeah, an important animal, you know, like I know the Egyptians really, uh, like looked up to cats and, you know, there's a lot of really important figures there and I just never really thought you know that they'd uh put as much effort into mummifi mummifying animals as they did you know their their own family I thought it was cool another thing that I noticed which was really uh different and new to me was how there was a link between humans and gods how they portrayed and uh believed and um how do I say, uh, that they prayed to animals or they uh, worshipped them in a way that they were considered goddess mm -hmm. back in the day. So that was really uh, new to me. Yeah, I think in general, you know, we now see animals in a much lower regard, but you look at most um, old I mean, religions or, you know, old cultures, and they respected animals and, yeah, exactly looked up to them as gods and goddesses. You know, they had a lot more, uh, I, think I guess, power. And between mm -hmm. how Egyptians view animals as equals as gods. Do you guys think that the reason <clears throat> why um, they were that close to animals or earth or living beings was because they all shared a place where they all live together because now <clears throat> nowadays it's like we have a separate society where humans live we have a separate society for animals and we're not able to like emotionally connect with them as much as like the folks did back in the days yeah that makes a lot of sense, that makes sense i think yeah. we're very separated now like you said you know uh, a lot of wild animals are seen, you know, just as that is like they're in their own habitat and we have our own and we don't really interact, you know, with them as much. I think that's definitely, yeah, a big reason. And also humans are pretty selfish in mm -hmm. gaining a lot, like gaining resources, land, like power. Yeah, and that's yeah. like a really interesting uh, point, man, Duke. Like we used to be like neighbors back when... Um, when humans were Egyptians, they, they, yeah, we were sharing the land and stuff, but now, yeah, it's more segregated. So that's probably why we have this modern view of them. I know, uh, Egyptians, they called, uh, they called souls like Ba, and they said that like even every living thing has the Ba inside them or a soul. So it's not much different than humans because we're very similar. Mm hmm. Yeah, on to the next reading. There's um there's the candle reading, which questioned how animals in India are still considered property, or can they be seen as beings with rights? So I know this case, um, they talked about the Naragara case, which was in uh, 2014, which ruled that animals have inherent right to live with dignity. I think that was cool. Um, I mean kind of what we were just talking about is, you know, humans are selfish and we've definitely taken as a species a very anthropocentric approach, you know, with like humans are above everything else and we, we own everything and we can control everything. 
um, and that includes as has included animals and so seeing different countries and societies push for animal rights and even if they're like okay well we're still it, it's more of a like a, a different um relationship than just we're gonna take and take and take and not give anything back you know yeah another thing that i would uh like to add how we were just talking about how like egyptians believed and like worship god and uh then we have the that now we have the article that we're talking about how um uh animals uh have the rights and they can whether they can be seen as like property or not so i have lived uh in india for like almost like 10 years and i have seen uh and learned even now that um cows are like sacred animal in india and beef is banned in india because uh hindus they worship cows as as a mother like as a goddess and uh So there is still some of some connection how like the in the modern world and back in the days where animals were still considered goddess and they were prayed to. But it's I feel like it's a little bit less now than it was before, but in some cultures and some religions, it's still believed that uh animals have souls, that they're actually considered more uh more living. sort of it's like more uh how do i put it like they're better than Yeah. us basically Mm -hmm. hold on okay bye i think uh one question i might have is i know that the fight for animal rights is a big one even in the u.s like in different parts and i wonder in different parts in india like how prominent that is as like a social movement is like the fight for animal rights So I think that'd be kind of interesting to look into. Yes, but there are like a lot of cultures in India, not just like Hindu, but there's uh, Muslims, there is Sikhs, so, and there's like Jainism as well. We will talk about that later in the podcast, but there's so many different cultures, so many different religions, but yet that same foundation of like respecting animals and believing that they were here before us, Mm -hmm. that we need to share our resources. Many of our resources actually do come from animals. if we think about it. So, Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. What do you think about like animal sacrifices in religion? If you ask me like personally that, what do I think of it? I feel that there is the way I have at least uh, grown up. the way I, my parents have taught me or the stuff that I have researched that there, I feel like that there is no God that would be happy if we kill a living being and offer it to God. Because at the end of the day, like there's a soul. yeah And I think yes, go ahead, Emma. oh sorry I, I think that's interesting too because yeah with all of these cultures and religions saying that animals also have a soul you know same as humans that almost it would equate the two being sacrificed like that would be equal you know I mean sacrificing an animal or sacrificing a human if they both have souls right they'd be the same so any anyone that doesn't <laughs> any god that wouldn't uh de I, I don't know if i want to say demand but ask a human sacrifice what also wouldn't to for an animal you know I feel like the whole sacrifice thing came from the idea like oh humans are powerful things and we can sacrifice other beings to worship our gods mm. and they usually now these days gods are viewed as humanoid forms you know And animals like in the, in the last reading we just did about the Egyptians like how they saw like and their gods were in animal forms right so like, like that's a whole different thing okay so the next reading Yeah, let's go next one. all right
All right, so Darwin, reading number three. The title is Emotions. So in this reading, basically, Darwin uh, examines emotions in animals, suggesting that animals experience complex feelings similar to humans, like joy, fear, and affection, and that uh, animals are not just uh, instant-driven. They have emotions they can feel just as we do. And uh, there's like great examples in that reading of how uh, animals animals feel uh, hurt or animals feel fear f just the way we do and how they protect themselves. Yeah, I mean, I think it's honestly kind of surprising um, to see perspectives that, like, animals wouldn't feel emotion or different, like, different types of emotion or even pain because they are, I mean, complex life forms, you know, just the way we are. Um, and we've seen, I'm sure we've all seen firsthand if an animal is scared or even, like, excited, right? I'm sure, you know, if you've ever had a pet or whatever, they're excited to see you when you come home or maybe they get scared of something outside and, and you can see them express that emotion. I honestly, oh. I honestly think it's interesting to say that um, animals have their own language, just like how we have our own different languages and we just can't understand them. Uh, it's interesting like how like my pet my husky would howl and then my other pet would also howl so I'm like thinking hmm, what are they th talking about <laughs> whatever but yeah that's what I think mm -hmm. yeah that's cool I also remember from the reading there is like a, an example I think it was from Darwin about how like uh, I think villagers they put like a bell on the, the cow's neck To like know where the or not the cow an elephant, the elephant. An elephant's <laughs> neck and then um later the elephants would like stuff dirt into the bell so that the bell wouldn't ring anymore which shows that the elephant like has emotions and has consciousness unlike um unlike what other people think as in they don't have emotions mm -hmm. another example would be um or what i think is i feel like elephants might even feel more emotions than we do because they have bigger bigger brains which means like more neurons so maybe when they're sad they're like two times as sad as we are <laughs> the part in the reading i don't remember which one was like talking about how much neuron doesn't matter about a consciousness i remember there was a bit about that but i'm not sure Maybe. yes another example <clears throat> where i have like uh researched on cows. I absolutely love cows. Not to eat, but actually just as an animal. Um, I absolutely love cows. And one of the things that I came across was uh, that like relates to what Darwin is saying, that uh, cows are, so basically they're in form, like, you will always see like at least two cows together. It's not, it's never one because there's get so close with one another that if you separate one cow from the other, they will get depressed, they will get sad and die. Mm, there's a lot of animals that are like that. Yeah. Yes. So that's, that's something that is like clearly shows <clears throat> that there is that consciousness, that there is that emotion, just how we are, that if we're with our you know best friend and if we're so far away from them, we feel sad and depressed because we want to hang out with them because mm -hmm. we're connected. And that's exactly how animals feel. And another, I did my uh, presentation uh, using the Darwin quote as well that uh, my I did my presentation on deer and how uh, when I was walking, I was actually, sorry, I was actually in the car. I was uh, going home and I saw a family of deer, how protective they were because they saw something that, okay, uh, because they were with their family and they wanted to make sure that they were protective. I wasn't going to harm them in any way. So the dad took in charge of protecting the whole family while the mother was watching the kids, making sure that they were okay, making sure that they were not going on the road. So like all those instant, they are basically the same how we have them, how our parents protect us, how our mothers take care of us, 
while we play and make sure we are uh, protected. Yeah. And I think um, there, to me, I found a connection actually between our next reading. So if um, we're, I don't know if anyone else has any more comments on this, but I do have a connection, you know, between the two. Well, I actually do have like mm -hmm. just one experience. Yeah. Um, I remember one of my dogs were, was very excited to see me, mm -hmm. but, and then he started jumping at me. He was, he's actually taller than, taller than me <laughs> and so I was kind of panicking but then my other dog saw what he was doing so he uh my dog came running to me kind of like trying to get the other dog off me so I was like oh my gosh they're protecting me <laughs> yeah they they like can you know sense what everyone's feeling which I think is cool mm -hmm. that's what yeah, that's yeah. well to add to that you know how mm -hmm. dogs They have special roles in humans' life, you know, how to like detect. I forgot like was to detect like diabetes or something or stuff like that. Like they're specialized dogs to smell. Oh, I forgot yeah. like I forgot like what it was specifically, but it's amazing how like dogs can like sense that while in speaking to us. Yeah. I think it's really interesting the way that you can train. Well, I think yeah, like service animals is a whole other thing. The way you can train them to sense even like uh, I've seen dogs that can are trained for like low blood sugar. Oh, is or, that what? Yeah, yeah, that's what I remember. Or Sorry. even like no, that's okay. Even like allergies. Yeah, I mean, all sorts of different things. I think it's really interesting. Um, one experience that I had recently was uh, last week I went to uh, Eastridge with my friend, and they have a place there called Mini Cat Town. And it's a rescue that they take, you know, foster kittens and then they adopt them out once they're like, you know, healthy and ready to be a, a companion animal to someone. And I I thought it was really fascinating just going in there. They had a lot of cats at the time, a lot of kittens. Um, Just being in there and seeing how they all interacted with each other. And so I thought that um kind of went into our next reading from Alger and Alger, which is cat culture and human culture. Which the, you know, the reading talks about how cats form different social structures and friendships with each other. Um, and how, I mean, there's social animals, you know, they seek companionship too. And so some of these uh, kittens, I don't have the, I took, did take pictures, I don't have them on hand. But there is a pair of two kittens that were just, you know, they were hanging out the whole time and they would find a spot on the couch and like they'd take a nap, you know, right next to each other. And they were, it just seemed like they were very bonded and like they didn't leave each other's side for very long. And I thought that was a really cool experience to see, you know, some of the cats would just walk by each other and not pay each other any mind. But these two cats just seemed like they were best friends. <laughs> and I thought that was really cool. Sorry, I have been there like to that place you mentioned many times. And it's like amazing how... Like, those cats are so used to humans, like, you mm -hmm. know, compared to feral cats. Yeah. Like, it shows that we can, it's easy to make a connection with animals, and, like, we don't take that for granted most of the time. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I would like to share is from the cat connection, basically. Uh, so I used to live with my parents, and uh, we used to have, uh, my neighbors had a lot of cats. There was that one particular cat that would basically kind of like live at my house. Like she would, she would always, she knew our timing, what time I would get home. And she knew what time I would go out for a walk. And every time that it was my time basically to go out for a walk, she would be literally at the door waiting for me to go oh. for a walk with me every day. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of like our schedule for years. And then when I moved my mom used to tell me all the time and I still she still sends me pictures that the cat waits for me at the door around the same time. Oh. Yeah. And I still have my car there so she even recognizes which car I used to drive. Oh. So when she misses me, she lays on the car. Oh. And I have pictures and videos that my mom sends me all the time that look at her, she misses you. So the fact that she still has a memory of me and I moved from my house in, I believe, in March mm -hmm. and it's October right now. 
So the fact that she still has a memory of me, she still feels that connection, and the fact that she's sad that I'm not there. Yeah. And then that's the that's like one of the things that fascinates me a lot is that when people say, oh, animals don't have feelings, they don't remember anything, or things like that, that they don't feel pain or fear, then I'm like, no, they do. They feel actually even more. The fact that they're not able to express, they don't have the same language as us, it's probably hard for them than it is for us. I think that's I remember this quote from Dawa, I think. It was like something which he said, like a dog would love its owner than itself. I think that's right. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yes, 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 I remember that. Yeah, I do. I Yeah, think th that animals are way more kind of like engaged and uh, selfless yeah than humans. Absolutely. I think that's why I think especially cats as well as a few other species make really good um not only companion animals but even like therapy animals. Like there's I've seen and these cats have, you know, training and stuff also, but that they can sense another uh, they can sense a human's like shift in emotion and then like know kind of how to act to like soothe them or make or like even distract them in certain situations but the fact that they know how to interact with us in a certain way i just think i just always thought that was really cool you want to move on to the next section yeah all right so the next section is on stewart and benjamin 2017 this talks about conflicting values which is anthropocentric biocentric and ecocentric ethics so anthropocentrism centers on human needs often justifying animal use solely for human benefit the second one is ecocentrism which views humans as part of an ecosystem with ethical obligations to all life forms within it and the last one is biocentrism which values all life suggesting animals have in, in intrinsic worth beyond their utility to humans I think this one, honestly, I think we could use this one to relate to most things that we read in the class because, I mean, I think our society, honestly, right now is very anthropocentric. I think I might have mentioned that earlier. Um, but, you know, just like you said, it is very central on human needs, um, which often leads to us exploiting animals for our own use. Um, and, you know, that can relate to things like capitalism and everything else. But... I think it's important to try to shift, even if it's just like our personal views and our personal actions towards like away from anthropocentrism in order to start talking about, you know, things like animal rights and everything else, you know, that we've been mentioning. So, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to shift to animal rights because mm -hmm. basically eating meat is like traditional to humans now it's like borderline just a daily need for humans but uh, to continue that talk um i need some <sighs> yeah i remember um yeah emma yeah you're right like now is like most it's mostly anthropocentric like there's like the cows and they're being cramped up and i remember reading something that was like that really hit me i was like we're drinking like cow milk which is like meant for a cow mm -hmm. and then it's not for humans so i was like well in a way we were kind of like stealing from the from the mom yeah the mama cow it made me a bit sad i'm not sure if it's in the reading but i do remember uh seeing something i honestly years ago at this point But um, I read that humans are the only species that outside of infancy, uh, or not only outside of infancy drink milk, but also we're the only species that drinks uh, another species milk. Yeah. You know, like we drink cow milk, like most humans, like their whole life. You know, you don't see a cow drinking another species milk, right? 
So I just, I just thought that was interesting and something that kind of relates to how we've been taking over the natural order as humans. Yes, and another uh, thing to add to that, I think humans are the only one where uh, we basically use, uh, like, for example, leather that c comes from animal skin. Mm -hmm. We literally kill animals that way we can wear leather shoes or leather purses or leather jackets. So for our own use, we kill them for those things that don't even, they're not even essential if that we need those purses or bags or boots in order for us to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it doesn't make any sense to me that the fact that we're killing those poor animals just for the sake of fashion. Right, yeah. Okay, it's been 30 minutes, guys, so we're going to, like, cut it. Oh. Yeah, um, <laughs> Eric, Eric, cut the recording. I didn't realize it's been that long.